WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Okay, good evening. This is Thomas Freed on the Liberty Works Radio Network. This is the Truth Attack Hour, and we're back this week after a hiatus last week uh, to talk about current events, the election a little bit, what's happening in the circuit courts, and of course I want to revisit my favorite topic, which is the Internal Revenue Service and how to deal with them in court and start winning, and then maybe we'll have time for a review of a economic recovery plan that the Republican, new Republican Congress and Senate might consider some elements of in proposing legislation here in the next two years where they have to deal with a Democratic president who's likely to veto everything that's too opposed to what he believes in the liberal progressive agenda, of course. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to uh, urge everyone in the listening audience to support the Liberty Works Radio Network. We need your help. It's your contributions that keep us some information on the air, and we are one of the few information sources in the country providing you with real information about what's really happening and how to correct the errors in the current system. And uh, I also want to urge everyone to support the Judicial Watch organization and to take advantage of the irszoom.com services in assisting Americans all over the country and responding to IRS correspondence wrongfully issued to them. I'd also like to point out that for the last couple of months now, I have repeatedly issued a challenge to any attorney or judge in the country to call into this radio show and cite for me the text of the original Supreme Court decision where the court declares that the income tax is a direct tax without apportionment under the 16th Amendment. No one's ever done that. We've also issued a challenge to any judge or attorney to call into the show and identify what statute in Title 26 makes any person liable for the payment of the income tax other than Section 1461, which, of course, makes the withholding agents as the tax collectors liable for the tax that they've collected from certain transactions with foreign persons, the same way that a store is made liable for the payment of the sales tax that it has collected from the transactions at its cash registers. But again, no attorney or judge has ever called the show to identify what statute makes you the individual person liable. And it's my assertion that when there is a statute that makes certain parties liable for the tax, like 1461, which makes the tax collectors liable, it's absolutely insane for the government to reject that statutory liability and instead enforce a non-existent imaginary liability that can't be demonstrated in statute. They reject what is written in law and enforce what is only in their own imagination and can't be shown to exist in the written law. And I guess that's why no attorney or judge has ever called the show and never will. But the fact of the matter is, is the system is being misadministered and misenforced because of this misadministration of the statutory liability, the misenforcement of liability. There is a statutory liability to enforce. It's ignored. Instead, they enforce their imagination which is not representative of the tax of the law. It's more representative of the communistic philosophy that they're trying to enforce under the second plank, which calls for a heavy progressive or graduated income tax, which, of course, is what the whole liberal system is really about, dividing the population into classes and then keeping the classes warring with one another rather than united under a representative government. We've talked about that before. Divide and conquer to rule by custom and tribute, not legitimate taxation. But until Americans become aware of what's happening, I guess we're just going to have to keep educating. Okay, well, the first thing I'd like to talk about this evening, um, of course, is the uh, results of the election. 
where we have a new Senate majority that displaces an obstructionist Harry Reid, who, in my opinion, has been one of the most uh, obstructionist politicians in the history of the United States of America, has some 300 or more bills stacked up on the Senate desk that he's refusing to allow to even come to a vote or a discussion of in the Senate. And uh, <laughs> that's why we get very little law reaching the president. Of course, now that he's gone, maybe the Republican Senate can start passing those pieces of legislation to the president, and we'll see what's up. He won't be able to avoid dealing with them anymore. He'll have to either enact them or veto them. And uh, hopefully the Republican majority will now get going doing that. But at least Harry Reid is gone from the leadership position in the Senate. He's still in the Senate, probably the leader of the minority, but nevertheless, it's, uh, without being the majority party leader, he no longer has the power to control the Senate or to dictate whether or not bills will be discussed and voted on, as he has been blocking from occurring for the past six years. So hopefully Congress can start doing some things, and we'll talk a little about that in a bit. But. I wanted to point out that we have a problem developing with the Obamacare legislation that's been enacted, which, uh, you know, they originally wanted to pass a single-payer health care system, but when they had the Democratic majority in both the Congress and the Senate with Obama in the first two years of his administration, they couldn't even get the Democratic Party to agree amongst its own members um, on a single-payer health care system. So they enacted the state exchange system instead, where the enrollees of the state exchanges are eligible for subsidies in order to encourage their participation. But the statutes enacting this specifically prescribe that it will only be the, enrollee in the enrollees in the state exchanges that are eligible for these federal subsidies. Now, of course, that's become a big problem because many of the states decided not to put up their exchanges, put up any health care exchange. And a lot of the states that did, including some of the most liberal, like Maryland and Oregon, um, spent a lot of money doing that and then ultimately have had to abandon their system entirely because it just doesn't work. It couldn't become functional. And so they abandoned it, passing everyone over into the federal exchange system, where they would not be eligible for a subsidy. So this, of course, uh, was unacceptable to the administration, and they began giving subsidies to the people enrolling in the federal exchange. Um, all of this, of course, without verifying income to determine whether or not they were truly eligible for the subsidy. Or, nor to determine exactly how much subsidy they might be eligible for. But nevertheless, they began granting the subsidies to people enrolling in the federal exchanges, and this was challenged in court. And uh, I'm going to read here my article on this developing situation, which is entitled The Democrat Controlled U.S. Circuit Courts Are Creating the Single Payer Health Care System That the Democratic Congress Couldn't Pass. The Democrats' congressional executive monopoly that existed from 2008 to 2010 couldn't pass a single-payer health care bill as law. But apparently, that's not going to stop the Democrat-appointed judges at the U.S. Circuit Courts from doing it for them on their own in rebellion by creating an operational single-payer system instead of one grounded in statute enacted by Congress. The reason why the statutes in the law specifically state that Obamacare subsidies will be distributed to enrollees of the state health care exchanges and not to any enrollees in any federal exchange is to specifically encourage the enrollees to enroll in their own state exchange system rather than enroll in a federal exchange where no subsidy would be available in order to ensure that there would not be a single-payer federal system. After all, if you can get subsidized help from either the state 
or the federal government. And given the unlimited resources of the federal government through its exclusive access to the Federal Reserve System, which is denied to the states, in comparison with the very limited resources of most of the individual states, then who in their right mind would ever sign up with the state exchange rather than the federal government if it doesn't matter which one you're in in terms of eligibility for the subsidy? Of course you're going to sign up in the federal exchange for the subsidy there. You'll only sign up for the state exchange if there is no subsidy available in the federal. Eventually, of course, a clear majority of the population would be signed up with the federal exchange and its enormous financial resources, making it impossible for the state exchanges to have a large enough enrollment base of healthy individuals to remain economically viable as a separate exchange. Thus, the state exchanges would eventually, one by one, collapse, forcing the entire population on to the federal exchange, where everybody would be eligible for the subsidies, thus creating the single-payer system in de facto operation that could not be enacted into law by the legislature for lack of popular support, even amongst the democratic monopoly, congressional majority monopoly, that existed at the time the law was enacted. The law is clear. No subsidies are authorized to be paid to any federal health care exchange enrollee. Only the state's exchange enrollees are included in the law as being eligible for the subsidy. The omission in the law of the federal exchange's enrollees' eligibility was intentional to specifically prevent a single-payer system from being created. Now, the liberal Democrat-appointed judges of the circuit courts are taking it upon themselves to rebel against the law and the Constitution again and rewrite the law on their own. And in so doing, create the single-payer federal health care system that it was the system was specifically denied by the Democratic Congress and President was being created at the time the law was enacted. From uh, U.S. District Court Judge Ronald White of the Eastern District of Oklahoma in ruling, this is a case of statutory interpretation. Such a case does not gut or destroy anything. On the contrary, the court is upholding the act as written. Congress is free to amend the ACA to provide for tax credits in both state and federal exchanges, if that is the legislative will. Okay, now this is a district court in Oklahoma that properly upheld the rule, the law, and they said that uh, it doesn't include federal enrollees, it limits it to the state. If Congress wants to amend the law, they can, but until then, the court is stuck with the way it's written. But what's happening in the circuit courts is they're reversing these rulings. Okay, that ruling comes from the District Court in Oklahoma after the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals and the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals have ruled in opposite directions on the Obama administration's interpretation of the law that subsidies for exchanges, quote-unquote, established by a state, may also include exchanges established by the federal government even though the law never originally provided that subsidies could be given through any federal exchange only to the state's enrollees. Arguing that the law was somehow ambiguous, the government further argued the IRS had deference in reconstructing the rules implementing the statute, contrary to the statute's clear command and limits. This judge in Oklahoma correctly rejected that nonsense. Okay, we're going to continue with this article when we get back from the commercial break. This is Thomas Freed on the Liberty Works Radio Network, the Truth Attack Hour. We'll be back in five minutes after these announcements. 
Creed. Network on the Truth Attack Hour. And, uh, I'm still waiting for that call from any judge or attorney in the country to tell me what statute makes me liable for the tax. And I argue if there's no statute that makes me liable for the tax, no one has any legitimate power to compel me to pay it, nor any other American citizen. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. But first, let's get back to our discussion about the single-payer health care system being created in the courts through the misadministration of the law by the liberal circuit court judges who are uh, all seditious progressive liberals who should be impeached for failure to honor their oath to uphold the Constitution and all of its provisions. They're going to reverse these correct holdings in the lower court, like this district court in Oklahoma where they held there are no subsidies available to enrollees of the federal exchange, only the state. And he's sorry if that means that most of the people enrolling won't be eligible for subsidies because they're all enrolling in the federal because none of the states created exchanges and those that did the exchanges failed. And if Congress wants to change the law, they can. But as is, no one enrolling in the federal system is allowed a subsidy. Now, this, of course, will mean that all of the people who the health care legislation was intended by the Obama minions to serve uh, won't be able to get health care. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you write 25 pages, 2,500 pages of law that nobody bothers to read and nobody knows what's actually in it. <laughs> So, um, you know, the district court judge in Oklahoma has got this right. They're not eligible, and they shouldn't be, and they can't be made eligible, or else you destroy all the state exchanges throughout the country, even those that are operating viably. As soon as people find out and they get a bigger subsidy and a sure deal over on the federal, that's where they'll go. And uh, just the same way they pushed this federal withholding in the workplace, so too where they pushed federal enrollment in the health care exchanges rather than the states. So, um, you know, the circuit court judges, the liberal progressive circuit court judges, which man most of the circuit courts around the country, are going to reverse this correct holding. And if the Supreme Court does not take the case and reverse the circuit court's erroneous decisions, we're all going to be stuck with the federal single-payer system that will result, which, of course, will ultimately end up delivering exactly the same type and quality of health care available today to the veterans in today's existing federal single-payer health care system at the VA, where nearly the entire budget is consumed not providing health care, but by the government's administrative bloated incompetent, corrupt bureaucracy who deliver no health care and no medicine or procedures, but rather consume all of the program's precious resources themselves so that the veteran patients end up dying while waiting in line to get an appointment to see the doctor who will prescribe their aspirin to the living or Oxycontin to the dying. <clears throat> The D.C. Circuit Court's ruling will be heard again en banc in an en banc hearing on December 17th, with all of the Democrat-appointed judges getting an opportunity to likely reverse the three-panel judge ruling upholding the law as written and replacing it with their communistic single-payer nonsense, effectively implementing the single-payer health care system that the liberal elitists really wanted all along to enact under the Obama presidency and administration before they are all thrown out of office by a disgusted national constituency. There are at least two more rounds of appeals for the Obama administration in this Oklahoma case, first through the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. But just like the D.C. and Fourth Circuits, the liberal activist judges on the Tenth Circuit are stacked with Democratic appointees making a favorable ruling for the state of Oklahoma, which brought the case, far less likely than the improper and unconstitutional exercise of judicial legislation by the Tenth Circuit Court judges, most probable. So, uh, they're creating the single-payer health care system in the circuit courts, even though they couldn't get it passed into law, 
The courts have become so familiar with the habit of judicial legislation and rewriting the law without consequence that they're doing it again now in the health care system. And there isn't really very much news media coverage of this developing story. So if you want to preserve any sense at all of a health care system in America, you need to be aware of what's being done and get to your representatives so that they can do something about it. Okay. Now, I want to go back and revisit what I've been talking about the last few weeks, if dealing with the IRS in court and picking up and utilizing a strategy that will enable you to win because it pins the court into the corner on an unsupportable position that they have assumed over the last 40 years. Um, um, I'm just going to go ahead and start reading the article here, see how it goes. How to beat the IRS in court. Everyone in America knows that there is something plainly wrong with the way the IRS is enforcing the federal income tax laws today. There is an obvious, fundamental, inherent contradiction present in the system that contradicts almost everything we are taught when we are young about how great America is and why, i.e., personal freedom, liberty, independence, privacy, property, security, rights, limited government, a right to work, legal due process, etc. Everything we are taught is directly contradicted by the operations of the IRS and the tax system we allow. Why is that? How did this happen? And what can we do about it? First, it is very important for everyone in America to understand that it is the enabling enforcement clauses of the Constitution and the amendments that are the actual provisions of the Constitution that give Congress the authority and power to write statutes as law in order to enforce the federal powers granted under the Constitution to the federal government to exercise, i.e., without an enforcement clause in the Constitution or an amendment for any given power granted thereunder, there is no actual authority for Congress to write law to enforce that specific power. So, what enforcement clause in the Constitution gives Congress the power to write law to enforce the federal income tax? Seems like a fair question, doesn't it? Okay, let's examine the answer. First, previous to the adoption of the 16th Amendment, of course, the taxation of income had been repeatedly upheld by the Supreme Court as a legitimate exercise of the indirect taxing powers given to Congress by the Constitution to tax by excise, impost, or duty under the constitutional powers and authority plainly granted by Article I, Section 8, Clause 1. And there are numerous Supreme Court decisions that discuss this position, this reality, this fact, and lay it out. Some of them are Springer v. U.S. from 1880, Pollock v. Farmers Loan and Trusts from 1895, Pacific Insurance Company v. Sewell, Springer v. United States, Spreckles Sugar Refining Company v. McLean, Flint v. Stone Tracy, 1911, Stratton's Independence Limited v. Halbert, 1913, and numerous other decisions, I'll lay this out. It is a well known that the power to tax income pre existed the 16th Amendment, pretty, uh, generally as an indirect excise power to tax corporations, but it had existed both as a duty impost and excise during the late 1880s. But it had been upheld numerous times as a legitimate exercise of the indirect taxing powers. Um, so, the power to tax income predated the 16th Amendment. Now, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18 of the U.S. Constitution, of course, plainly and clearly provides the enforcement authority as the enabling enforcement clause for these indirect Article 1 taxing powers. And this enforcement clause in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18 reads, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers, and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. So this enforcement clause, this enabling clause, 
is actually the clause, the single clause, that gives Congress the power and authority to write law to enforce all of the Article I powers that are identified there in Section 8. And this, uh, the federal government, to, uh, okay, this Article I clause of the Constitution, of course, is the enabling enforcement clause that allows the federal government to enforce by written law the indirect taxing powers of the federal government that are granted in Article I, Section 8, Clause 1, i.e., the power to tax indirectly by impost, duty, or excise. So there is clearly an enforcement clause allowing the enforcement of tax as an indirect tax. However, if this is the empowering enforcement clause that serves as the enabling enforcement clause that gives the government, in the form of the IRS, the enforcement authority to lawfully operate under to enforce the collection and payment of the federal personal income tax against individuals, then, of course, and obviously, it then becomes absolutely necessary to identify how the IRS has determined that any specific individual person is subject to one of these indirect taxing forms, i.e., an imposed duty or excise. The problem here, of course is that American citizens are not normally subject to any impost, duty, or excise tax simply as a result of exercising their right to work. First, imposts are taxes imposed on foreign goods being imported into the United States for sale here, and potentially on any other foreign activity conducted in the United States by a foreign person. Citizens, of course cannot be made subject to any impost unless they are involved in foreign trade by importing goods for sale in America. Most citizens are not involved in that activity and do not derive their living or earnings from that sort of taxable activity. Second, duties are taxes on American goods, American goods, being exported for sale in foreign markets. And that means that citizens, again, cannot be made subject to any duty unless they are involved in exporting American goods for sale in foreign markets. Most citizens, of course, are not involved with exporting goods for sale in foreign markets to earn a living. That leaves only the third category of indirect taxation to examine, the power to tax by excise. Fortunately... That examination has already been done for us. The Supreme Court has def definitively settled the legal issue of the constitutional scope of legal authority of the Congress to tax by excise. It was specifically held in the Flint v. Stone Tracy decision of 1911, which decision is now recognized as controlling constitutional law, having been cited and followed over 600 times by virtually every court in the nation as the authoritative definition of the legal scope of the federal excise taxing powers. And the court held very simply that excise taxes are taxes laid upon the manufacture, sale, or consumption of commodities within the country, upon licenses to pursue certain occupations, and upon corporate privileges. The requirement to pay such taxes involves the exercise of the privilege, and if business is not done in the manner described, no tax is payable. It is the privilege which is the subject of the tax and not the mere buying, selling, or handling of goods or earning of income. Therefore, since most American citizens do not earn their living from the manufacture, sale, or consumption of commodities within the country. Okay, we're coming up on another break here. We'll pick up this article when I get back. This is Thomas Freed on the Liberty Works Radio Network. Uh, we're here on the Truth Attack Hour. And we'll be right back after five minutes with more of a discussion on how to start beating the IRS in court. This is Thomas Freed on the Liberty Works Radio Network on the Truth Attack Hour, and we're back to pick up with our discussion. 
And I'd like to point out I'm still waiting for that phone call from any judge or attorney in the country who can tell me what statute makes me liable for the payment of the tax, where the text of the decision of the Supreme Court decision stating the tax is directed out apportionment can be found. And now I'd like to add a challenge to anyone to identify what constitutional enforcement, enabling enforcement clause, applies to any allegedly new power to tax under the 16th Amendment directly and without apportionment. Because I'd like to point out, as the article we'll get to in a moment, there is no enforcement clause that's part of the 16th Amendment. So any allegedly new power created under the amendment can't be enforced with law. Congress doesn't possess power to enforce the provisions of the amendment by appropriate legislation. Appropriate legislation means you can't write law for it. This is why it's important to realize that the pre-existing power, previous to the 16th Amendment to tax income indirectly, is still the only power that exists to be enforced. And as we were discussing before the commercial break, we've identified that those indirecting powers come in three forms, imposts, duties, and excises. Citizens aren't subject to imposts because those are taxes on foreign goods entering the country and on foreign activity. Citizens aren't foreign. Well, they're not subject to the imposts. Duties are taxes on American goods being exported for sale in foreign markets, and most citizens don't derive their living from that activity, so they're not subject to duties. And excise taxes, the courts held, are taxes laid upon the manufacture, sale, or consumption of commodities, upon licenses to pursue certain occupations, and upon corporations who enjoy a privilege in their existence when they earn, rather than the citizens who have a right to work and do not enjoy any federally granted privilege in exercising that right and earning a living. Now, the corporate earnings, because of the privileged existence, are subject to the income tax, but the earnings of the citizen earned by right are not, because those earnings earned by right are not subject to the excise taxing powers, which are limited to commodities, licenses, and corporations. Since, therefore, since most American citizens do not earn their living from the manufacture, sale, or consumption of commodities within the country, nor from any license to pursue their certain occupation, nor from the privilege of incorporation, <clears throat> was an operational vehicle, it therefore appears that a citizen exercising his simple right to work in order to earn a living, pursuit of happiness, is not subject to the imposition or payment of any federal tax that is indirect, income or otherwise, neither by imposed duty nor excise, according to the Supreme Court's definitive legal scope of those taxing authorities. Maybe this explains why the federal personal income tax was not paid on work generally or employment specifically by any American citizens until after World War II. So what happened after World War II to change things? Well, two things happened. One, the American people were duped into allowing withholding that is not actually required by law, but rather is simply allowed by a naive and misinformed but indoctrinated American worker. And two, the lower federal district courts began enforcing the federal personal income tax for the first time as though it were authorized under the 16th Amendment as a direct tax without apportionment, a new taxing power. Since that time, the lower federal tax districts and circuit courts have wrongfully entered into a rebellion with the executive branch against the Supreme Court and the constitutional limitations on the federal taxing powers and have since the 1950s improperly completely reversed the true Supreme Court holdings on the legal issue of the federal income tax repeatedly ruling, without explanation or supporting sight of any text of any original opinion, that the Supreme Court held in 1916 that the federal personal income tax was authorized under the 16th Amendment as a direct tax without apportionment, which is absolutely incorrect 
erroneous and a complete reversal of the true original court holdings. The Supreme Court plainly held in 1916 in upholding the indirect nature of the income tax under the 16th Amendment that the provisions of the 16th Amendment conferred no new power of taxation but simply prohibited the previous complete and plenary power of income taxation possessed by Congress from the beginning from being taken out of the category of indirect taxation to which it inherently belongs. This is from Stanton versus Baltic Mining, which was handed down in 1916. It's one of the true, two controlling Supreme Court decisions on the issue of the income tax. And what it says again is that the provisions of the income tax conferred no new power of taxation, but simply prohibited the previous power of income taxation from being taken out of the category of indirect taxation to which it inherently belongs. It says the power to tax income inherently belongs in the indirect category. And the 16th Amendment confers no new power. It simply prohibits the power from being removed from the indirect category. So the effect of the 16th Amendment, the Supreme Court says here, is to permanently classify the income tax as an indirect tax. So how on earth have the lower courts, circuit courts, and tax courts gotten away with 40 years for ruling it's a direct tax without apportionment as a new taxing power under the 16th Amendment. They're either idiots or conspirators. <clears throat> In Bruchaber, the court wrote, it clearly results that the proposition that the tax is direct and the contentions under it, if acceded to, would cause one provision of the Constitution to destroy another. That is, they would result in bringing the provisions of the amendment exempting a direct tax from apportionment into irreconcilable conflict with the general requirement that all direct taxes be apportioned. This result would create radical and destructive changes in our constitutional system and multiply confusion. Now, what the court is addressing here is what I've discussed before on the show in previous lectures about how you can't use the 16th Amendment to destroy the prohibition on direct tax without apportionment that still exists in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3. It's simply improper to use one law to destroy another, and it's even more improper to destroy use one provision of the Constitution to destroy another, especially when the amendment doesn't even contain the word direct in describing the tax authorized under the amendment. And there's no enforcement clause associated with the amendment that was adopted as part of the amendment that would give Congress the power to write law, appropriate legislation, to enforce the allegedly new taxing power. So, now, however, the lower courts, instead of following these plain and clear controlling decisions of the high court, now instead cite inferior decisions of the circuit courts, like United States v. Collins in 1990, Parker v. Commissioner in the Fifth Circuit in 1984, Lovell v. United States in the Seventh Circuit from 1984, which simply cites the Parker and make its conclusion. These inferior lower court rulings erroneously conclude that the Bruchaber and Baltic mining rulings cited above acted to uphold the federal personal income tax as a direct tax without apportionment, rather than to reject that argument, as was plainly and clearly actually done by the court. The federal income taxing powers were upheld, of course, for so many years previous to World War II, 31 years in fact, as indirect taxing powers enforced under the enabling Article I, Section 8, Clause 18, Enforcement Clause of the Constitution, that it became presumptuously assumed across time by the judges of the lower federal district and circuit courts and tax court that the income tax taxing powers of the Constitution existed as constitutionally enforceable powers. However, now that the lower courts are openly ruling in blatant rebellion against the Supreme Court and the Constitution, that the income tax being enforced today is a direct tax without apportionment, authorized for the first time as a new taxing power under the 16th Amendment, 
it seems reasonable to now ask what enforcement powers exist in the Constitution to allow the enforcement of that new taxing power. This is a fair question, since no enforcement clause exists in the 16th Amendment, giving Congress the necessary constitutional authority to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions or taxing powers of the 16th Amendment. Therefore, no new taxing power allegedly created for the first time under the amendment may be legitimately enforced by the IRS or the DOJ, Department of Justice, or the federal courts, because there is no enforcement clause in the Constitution to authorize such enforcement actions. The rebellious lower courts today, of course, completely reject indirect taxation as the constitutional basis of the federal income tax and seem to have completely forgotten the original applicability of the pre-existing constitutional enforcement authority for the indirect taxing powers that are granted under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, i.e. to tax by impost duty and excise, and that are enforced under the enabling enforcement clause provided by Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18 that existed in the Constitution before the adoption of the 16th Amendment. On the other hand, Enforcement clauses plainly do exist in Amendments 13, 14, 15, 18, 19, 23, 24, 26. These amendments to the Constitution are dated both before and after the adoption of the 16th Amendment, plainly showing the intent of the authors of the 16th Amendment to intentionally not empower the Congress to enforce by legislation any direct income tax without apportionment under the 16th Amendment, but instead forcing the Congress to rely on the pre-existing enforcement powers granted under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18 to enforce the income tax as one of the indirect taxing powers that are granted under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1. So the question now is, how can we use this knowledge and understanding and information to begin defeating the IRS in court? The answer, of course, is to hoist them on their own petard. Whenever an American citizen is in court with the IRS over an income tax dispute, that citizen should immediately should submit three motions to take judicial notice of law on the Supreme Court decision of Brusheba v. Union Pacific Railroad and of Stanton v. Baltic Mining and of Flint v. Stone Tracy, moving the court to take judicial notice of the indirect nature of the federal income taxing powers under the 16th Amendment as plainly and clearly held by the Supreme Court in 1915 in its controlling decisions. The lower courts, in their rush to uphold the de facto collection operations, and out of their extreme arrogance and absurd ignorance, will deny the motions and instead will accept and endorse the argument of the Department of Justice attorneys that the income tax under the 16th Amendment is authorized by that amendment as a direct tax without apportionment. As soon as the court issues that ruling as its conclusion to your motions to take judicial notice of law, you immediately file a motion for summary judgment if you filed the legal action, or a motion for dismissal with prejudice if the IRS filed the legal action, for lack of constitutional authority to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of the amendment and the taxing powers created by the amendment, the new taxing powers created by the amendment, on the grounds that if the income taxing powers of the federal government are deemed by the court to be a new power to tax directly for the first time without apportionment because of the adoption of the amendment, then as a new power created under the amendment, that new power cannot be legitimately enforced by any branch of the federal government. Okay, I'm going to post this article on my website at taxfreedom.com if you want to hear the rest of it. This is Thomas Freed, the Liberty Works Radio Network on the Truth Attack Hour, bringing you the truth. We'll be back next week with more information. 